So my next question, again to George, is kind of continues on the issue of the political implications. So for all the enormous interest and lauding of your work, certainly deservedly so, there have also been some critiques, I'm sure you know, of the series, by which I mean both the book series and the TV series, political and social implications. Now, in many ways, we could say that the series really kind of undermine traditional notions of power, that, that they really, in some ways, very much play with, you know, as we've talked about, about phallic constructions of power, kind of subverting it. But at the same time, you know, there has been some critique of the works in terms of issues of gender and sexuality and race. So, for example, with the TV series, it even led to the, con the coinage of a new term, sex position, Right, which people talk about it, kind of laugh about the way that sometimes there'll be uh, these scenes with, with sexual activity or nudity to kind of prevent the information of narrative, kind of narrative information from seeming boring, that you have the sex going on. So some people say, okay, so women and sexual minorities are there for just kind of titillation purposes and not much else. And there have also been some critique of some of the racial tropes, for instance, using the trope of the kind of white savior of dark people, like in the case of Daenerys Targaryen. So I'm curious, do you think that these critiques are justified? How do you respond to those critiques? Well, you're, that question covers a lot of territory. Uh, Good time, the professor here. <laughs> there, there are. Uh, let me try to separate that into component parts here. First of all, you have to separate the books from the television right. show. They're, they're, they're two different things. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very, uh, very, very clear, as in the case of uh, this white savior business right. with the, the scene with Daenerys, um, where she is uh, hailed by the, uh, the slaves that she's just freed in the city of Yunkai. Um, that scene is drawn largely from the books, but in the, in the books, I, I think I make it very clear that uh, the slavery of uh, Slaver's Bay of Yunkai and Astapur and Marine is not racially based. Mm -hmm. It's not American um, slavery, uh, which was strictly race-based. It's modeled much more on the, the slavery of the ancient Near East of the Romans and the, and the Greeks. Uh, where slaves could be of any race, um, you know, it could just be the guys who lost the last war. Um, you know, the Greeks enslaved each other. You know, if Thebes defeated Athens in a war, a bunch of Athenians would suddenly be slaves and Thebes, and vice versa. Um, the Romans conquered people of various colors in Africa and, and very different covers and colors in Germany and Gaul and made slaves of them all. Um, and that's certainly what I depict in the books. Uh, and I think that's what is meant to be depicted in the TV show, too. But there are practicalities with running a TV show. Mm -hmm. those, those scenes were filmed in Morocco. Um, and the people that you see are extras mm -hmm. who are paid you know, $30 a day or something like that to, uh, to perform. Um, just to be in the background. Um, when you film that, you, the practicalities are you put out a call for extras and mm -hmm. people show up and, uh, and you sign up as many as you need. Um, when you do that in Morocco, Moroccans show up right. and... <laughs> So I don't know what the, I mean, obviously there's an implication there that uh, people took of it, perhaps people who had not read the books, yeah. um, that all of the people that she freed were, were brown or black, and that yeah. certainly not the, was not intended to be the case. But yeah. on the other hand, flying in people from, uh, um, from Ireland to, in order to yeah. people this scene in Morocco just to stand in the crowd would have been uh, very, very cost prohibitive. Yeah. These are the kind of practicalities of television yeah. uh, production that, that some critics never take into advantage. I mean, if you look at the Dothraki, for example, we, we filmed these Dothraki scenes with Daenerys in a number of different places. And, you know, like some of the early scenes, our, our main location is Belfast in Northern Ireland, and we film 
in areas around Belfast. Now, Danny in particular has film scenes in Morocco, in Malta. Uh, she's filming some in Spain right now. We, we move around, um, but some of the early Dothraki scenes when she was first with Khal Drogo were actually filmed in, in the fields outside Belfast in Northern Ireland yeah. in, in forests and grasslands. And if you look at those closely, there's a lot of kind of pasty white Dothraki yeah. uh, <laughs> because those are the guys who showed up when we put a yeah. casting call. Yeah. Hey, do you have long hair? Can you ride a horse? And, uh, you know, you hire who you show up. And with gen I mean, that scene, you know, with, with Daenerys too, I mean, it ties to the gender issues. I know what you're saying about the differences between the TV show and the book, that it's very different, let's say, the issues of sexual violence that are in the TV program are not like the scene, you know, that is not a rape of, of Danny in, in your book. And I know that, so I, I understand exactly what you're saying about the, 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 between the difference between the television and, but as a, you know, but you're also an executive producer of the TV series. Do you have, can you kind of negotiate those things with them or, you know, how does that work to say, I, I don't like the way you're, you're translating this? You know, I'm involved in a television show, but it's, it's really run by David Benioff and, and mm -hmm. Dan Weiss. Um, you know, and I don't consult every day. I'm not, I'm not in Belfast. I'm, I'm uh, mm -hmm. you know, in Santa Fe trying to, half a world away trying to finish my book. So I do consult with them. They, we talk regularly. They sometimes ask my opinions and sometimes they don't. Um, but I don't think in, the, in that particular case I would have done anything different. I mean, they, frankly, it, I don't even think I realized there was a problem there until people started pointing out there was a problem. Maybe that's my blindness or the blindness of David and Dan, but it was just, you know, the practicalities if you're going to do that scene. I mean, how do you, how do you get that? Where, where do you get the, the mixed racial things when you're trying to hire a thousand extras for a scene mm -hmm. and you're doing it in Morocco? I, I, I don't know. You know, do you use CGI to, to change their complexion or uh, mm -hmm. do, you know, do you say we have enough brown people? Sorry, we're not hiring any more of you brown people. Uh, you know, people. Uh, only white people should. I, I don't know. I don't know how you, how you do that. but. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there is a better way, and we should have thought about it more, but uh, I don't know that. Now, let me go to another part of that question, which is the sex position question. That was a, that was a very <laughs> cool uh, coinage, mm -hmm. uh, which was coined by, uh, I think it was Miles Nutt, the yes, critic it was. Miles Nutt, yeah. for referring to a, one particular scene. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think it was probably justified for that particular scene. Littlefinger is giving a long speech in the brothel, and meanwhile there's, there's right. a, a couple girls getting it on in the background. And, uh, <laughs> and it was parodied on Saturday Night Live and all that. But I, I do think that, like many of these tropes that Odie's Cornish has come forward, it's, it's been ma vastly misused. People who don't seem to un actually understand the scene have started applying it to any scene that has sex. Mm -hmm. I don't think sexuality is sex position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, s sex position was that one particular right. thing where they're trying to put something, um, I guess, visually interesting on, on, right. on the scene while, they're, while someone is delivering, a, you know, a long nugget of uh, backstory. Right. Um, George, let me, let, let me come at this from a different way because there's another side to your characters, another side to what you're doing. As you illuminate in your Rolling Stone interview from, a, from maybe about a year ago, you deride the fact that fantasy is mostly inundated with evil, ugly, dark lords who, who go to battle with dashing, brave heroes. And you've kind of turned that paradigm upside down. I'm going to have a follow-up to Tom on this in a second. Your books feature a dwarf as, as a major character, if not the, the sole, the most reasonable voice, a disabled boy, um, many of the characters, uh, a, a prostitute plays, uh, several seem to be wise and heroic. You have a character who commits in the first book and the first season of the show an irredeemable act who is now in the, since he's lost a, a limb, is becoming almost I, I, I hesitate to say heroic, and yet that's what it is. Um, you seem to have changed the nature of heroism as it has been traditionally defined in fantasy and science fiction. Is that something you set out to do consciously, or did, just, did, or did it evolve? Did characters like Tyrion Bran um, and Jamie Lannister, did they just evolve organically? 
Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I've always been attracted to great characters. Um, I think they're more interesting than, uh, than heroes, you know, who are just going around being heroic all the time. Is that why, by taking Jamie's hand away, he becomes a more sympathetic character and, and seeks redemption instead of continuing on the path he was on before? Well, he certainly has to redefine himself, and, and in that comes a lot of personal anguish and, and personal growth and personal struggle, all of which is, you know, great material for, uh, for drama. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up as a comic book fan, as I mentioned. That was my, my first stuff was publishing comic fanzines. And uh, a huge influence on me when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old was, was uh, Stan Lee and the Marvel comics. And that was one of the things he did, you know. I'd, I'd been reading DC comics for years when Marvel started. And the, the DC stories were all completely circular, you know. Was, Batman was swinging around Gotham City and, you know, here comes the Riddler or the Joker. And he defeats the Riddler and the Joker and they go in. But there's never any surprises. The story ends right where it begins, so next week he can deal with Poison Ivy or whatever. And um, you always knew who the heroes were, you always knew who the villains were. Um, and Stan Lee th threw all that out. He, That's right. He, 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 you know, the Fantastic Four, what a revelation that was in 1961. You know, one of, one of the guys on the team was a monster. And he didn't like being a monster. And he was angry at the other people on the team. They were fighting within each other. Justice League never fought within each other. And I discovered really the, the powers of conflict and the powers of gray characters. And they continue to, I mean, I love Lord of the Rings, and I think Boromir is my favorite character. He's the one who, who succumbs, you know. He's a mm. hero, but he's also fatally flawed. And, uh, you know, he, he fails at the last moment. And, and, you know, you're rooting for him, but then... Uh, and Peter Jackson did a great job in the movie. We're showing his temptation. You really, you really like Boromir, but, you know, then he turns against Frodo, corrupted by the ring, but then he dies so heroically, full of arrows. Yeah. Sean Bean dying one of his many deaths. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> So I love to write about characters like that, and intellectually, I always, I also, I also find the question of, of redemption fascinating. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not religious now, but I was raised a Catholic, so maybe it's, maybe it's uh, questions that, I, uh, that come to me from my whole Catholic upbringing and the, the things I learned from uh, nice. Sister Mary Elephant or something in catechism. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, the, the whole question of forgiveness for sin, you know, that the Catholic Church teaches you go to confession and you are forgiven for your sins, even terrible sins. Um, but certainly our society doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily deal with that. Uh, we, we, we don't forgive people. Even I don't forgive people. I recognize, you know, I'm a great character myself here, I, you know. As some of you know, follow my, my uh, blog. I'm a, I'm a football fan. Nice I'm, a, question. I'm a fan of the Giants and the Jets. But it, it bothers me that Michael Vick is on, my, is on my Jets team. And I know he's paid his debt to society and all that. But I can't just bring myself to root for this guy. Yeah. But, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and then um, people yeah. say, well, what about your belief in redemption? Well, yeah, I know. But <laughs> it's still, it's hard. It's hard. <laughs>